Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out. My name is Hadi Sayed. I'm Joshua Freda. And we're here to present the SNF processor. So just a quick overview, overview of what we're going over today. Um, we're going to discuss the memory architecture, register set, data types, addressing modes, instruction types and formats, hardware implementations, interrupt handling, and planned enhancements. So the SNF processor is a 32-bit MIPS machine. It uses a Harvard memory architecture. Basically, this means that it uses separate 32-bit address instruction and data memories. The memory operands are stored in big Indian format, meaning that the LSB is stored in the lowest address, while the MSB is stored in the highest address. So for our register set, our, our SNF processor uses 32 registers, of which all of them are 32 bits wide. Um, some notable registers, the program register holds the 32-bit value of the address of the next instruction to be fetched. Uh, and the PC register is incremented by 4 after every instruction. We also have the flags register, which holds the status of the interrupt enable, carry, overflow, zero, and negative flags. Um, our SNF processor has two data types. They are the 32-bit unsigned and signed integers. The 32-bit unsigned integers range between 0 to approximately 4 million, and the updated flags for this data type are overflow, overflow, carry, and 0, while for the 32-bit signed integers, it ranges between approximately negative 2 million to 2 million, uh, while which uh, the MSB determines the sign, and the updated flags are overflow, negative, carry, and 0. Um, the SNF processor has three addressing modes. They are immediate register addressing and register indirect addressing. For the immediate addressing, this is used in I-type instructions at the least significant 16 bits uh, of the instruction. Um, if a condition for a branch instruction is met, the 16-bit immediate field is sign extended to 32 bits. So we take the um, bit 16 sign extended and we add 2 bits of 0 and shift it left 2 times. For register addressing, this is used in R-type instructions, where the operands are the source registers RS and RT, and it is and the output is placed in the destination destination register specified by RD. For register indirect addressing, the effective address of the operand is calculated by adding the contents of a register plus an offset rather than in the instruction itself. This um, Addressing mode is used for store, load, and jump instructions. So these are the three uh, instruction formats. We have R-type instructions, I-type instructions, and J-type instructions. So for the R-type instructions, the opcode field is always going to be zero. It is followed by the uh, RS register field, then the RT register field, and the destination, destination register field specified by RD. And then we have a shift amount field, which is only used during shift instructions. And then the function code, which uh, allows us to specify what operation we are performing. Uh, with the I-type instruction, the opcode specifies what type of I instruction we are performing. It's followed by the RS and RT registers. And then the 16-bit immediate value, which I discussed earlier on. And for the J-type instructions, the opcode determines what J-type instruction we are performing and uh, the 26-bit jump address which we would be jumping to. So I'm going to go over the uh, control diagrams for these uh, instruction formats. So for the R-type, we start off in the fetch state. Uh, in this state, we fetch the instruction located at a memory address uh, stored in the program counter and then we store, the, and then we store in the instruction register. After that, we jump to the decode state, where we decode that instruction to figure out what operation we're going to be performing. And then we have the essentially the execute state, and then uh, right back from the ALU into the register file. For the I-type instruction, first uh, essentially starts off the same. We start off with the fetch instruction, go to decode, perform the I-type instruction, and then we uh, do a write back immediate, rather than a write back from the ALU out. Uh, for the branch instructions, we start off same thing, fetch, decode, and then we perform a branch calculation. And then we have to check the flags, and uh, what, depending on what the uh, status of the flags is, that'll tell us if we're going to be branching or not. And then we have the jump instruction. 
Uh, so perform fetch, decode, and then we update the program counter and jump at that address. For the hardware implementation, we have three main modules. The central processing unit, which itself is made up of three main of its own three main modules, data memory and I/O memory. The CPU has various buses that connect the instruction unit and the integer data path with the various signals required to drive each of the parts. In the instruction unit, we have a PC MUX, a PC counter, a program counter, an instruction memory, and an IR register with a sign extended out for immediate instructions. The PC MUX selects what type of input is going into the PC in the case of a, a jump or a load needed to update the program counter and it, its output is used to index the instruction memory location that is then stored into the IR register for the various fields needed for the integer data path and the decode states. The integer data path has the main files, the main modules of a register file and an ALU with intermediate registers and MUXs in between. The S address is selected by a S select signal determining if we want to choose the stack pointer or the normal S address uh, IR register field. The DMUX has a similar thing selecting uh, hard coded 32 and 29 for respective uh, registers and then the various other possible registers. Uh, the register output is then going through to RT and RS. RT will have its input selected though either from the register file or from the various possible inputs that are used for stack pointer and just data memory input. The RS it goes through before getting to the ALU at SMUX where it potentially will get the input from the ALU out in the, for stack pointer functionality. What's the, what, what would be the other input to the SMUX? That yeah. would be an ALU out, there's just no wire actually okay. connecting it right now. Okay. That's all right. The ALU out selects what type <coughs> of operation is going to happen but via the FS field. This ALU out will then generate the Y high and Y low in the case of a multiplier divide, otherwise it's just the Y low and the various status flags. The YMUX selects the final output of the integer data path from the various fielding registers that can be coming from data memory, the ALU, and then the 64-bit holding stages for the multiplying divide. In the case of overall, we have two different main memories, one for input and output, and one for data. Both memory modules are 4K by 32, and function relatively the same in big Indian format with chip select, read, and write, but the I.O. memory has the ability to generate a interrupt signal and hold that signal high until an interrupt acknowledge is received from the control unit in a handshake protocol. To access the I.O. memory, we have the input command which loads data from memory at an address pointed to by an operand and its offset, and it loads it into a destination register. This is done with four main stages which fetch and decode previously mentioned and input which takes the effective address calculations and puts it into ALU. This is then used to index data memory which is shoved into the data memory in and it has and then is written back into the uh, register file. Output for memory works relatively the same way but with some slight differences. And, but it, and it writes data held from a source register into a destination pointed at by an operand and an offset. It also has fetch and decode, and then same with the effective address calculation. I.O. memory is then given what is held on the DN register. Interrupt handling is, ha is handled by the fact of the steady command where it sets the I interrupt enable flag. Without this flag, no interrupt is possible. This is done by the fact in the fetch state it checks against the flag if the, and after IO sends an interrupt request. The processor checks the flag and if it's, the flag is disabled, it goes about its business and checks for the next command from the 
IR register and I own instruction memory. If it is enabled though, the stack pointer register is then pre-decremented and saves the program counter and current state of the flags. And the program counter is loaded with the current with the address for the interrupt, which is 3FC. The interrupt is handled in six main states, with the stack pointer being shoved being put into the RS and event and then stuck into the ALU out in the next state. This value is then used to index data memory and is put into DN for the register file. At the, at the next state, the program counter is then loaded with this. Um, yeah. The program counter is updated with the stack pointer memory and ALU out gets the post decremented value and program and RT gets the current program counter's value. The current program counter value is then put into the dimmer, uh, new data memory location, and AOE out is once again pre-decimated to get the flags for the in the RT. These flags are then set into the new location on the top of the stack, and the stack pointer is updated to its final location. Return from interrupt is the undoing of the interrupt request, in that the Current stack pointer is put into the AOEA for effective address, and the data memory's location is put into DN. The stack pointer is then pre-incremented and used in AOEA as the effective address. This effective address's location and data memory is put into D DN to return the flags, and AOEA is then once again uh, incremented. The program counter then returns the saved program counter location, and AOUL gets the next location for stack pointer. And stack pointer is returned to its original state. Can you go back to your uh, interrupt processing slides? Just one back, yeah, so, oh, this one? yeah, right there. So here you're uh, post decrementing, right, mm -hmm. for your pushes. Then go forward a slide. Here you're post incrementing. You're actually using the stack pointer before incrementing, so that would throw everything off. Both of them are you're, you're accessing memory either to read or write, and then either incrementing or decrementing. So you didn't pre decrement or increment here. Okay. You got it and yep. used it right away without doing the plus four. Then you did the plus four. So maybe that's how the stack got messed up. Yeah, you definitely would not be reading the right location. Yeah. You didn't find that, that had a problem when you did like module 13, or, or this would be 14? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you recall like from our, yeah, I mean like 13 and 14, remember it was like a little different, we didn't follow. Yeah, so did you actually do this in the, in your project? Uh, I don't, I didn't do that specifically. Oh, okay. So, then Josh but, would know. I don't remember if I specifically was doing it this way or just this is what I had as RTL in my head. I was doing yeah, it correctly. Yeah, I think we would need to go back and check and see if this is a typo or <coughs> if the project is actually. Exactly. Okay, just keep rolling. And then the plan enhancements we had for the SNF processor was originally going to be uh, rotate left and rotate right. They were unable to be implemented in the final version because of unforeseen events and timing constraints. But most of the coding for them was finished, and they can be put in at any time. Just add it to your barrel shifter, yeah? No, the barrel shifter is there, and it works fine. It's yeah. just I removed the code because when I had given it to Hadi for the finalized version for printing, it just didn't reach him in time for when printing happened. Okay, got it. So I just took it out, and that's it. Any questions?